the 20th trip to the NCAA tournament, nets the first Final Four for the Gonzaga Bulldogs. It's been 78 years since the Ducks have flown to the Final Four, and they are heading to Phoenix. It's over. South Carolina is going where they have never gone before, the Final Four. Carolina Blue to Arizona as the final piece in the 2017 Final Four. Wow, absolutely spectacular. Welcome to SI Now. It's Monday, March 27th. Ryan, the final four is set. Of course, North Carolina continues their revenge tour, looking yeah. for redemption from last year's heartbreaking loss. And then there are three other teams. Oh, the three others, right. The three right. other teams, Gonzaga, <laughs> South Carolina, in the final four for the very first time in school history. Oregon hasn't been this far since the 1930s. So, Ryan, do all these newcomers, relative newcomers, make you more excited for the final four? Or are you concerned we may limp to the finish line. Oh, yet. I'm excited. And wow, what a bow put on the weekend yesterday by North Carolina and that ending with Kentucky. Yeah. But no limping here to the Final Four. I'm very excited. Obviously, the blue blood is there in North Carolina. And uh, we're going to see quite the matchup contrasting styles with Oregon. I mean, 85 points per game for North Carolina. Oregon plays defense, 69 points per game they're allowing. So something's got to give in that game. What I'm most excited to see, though, obviously, you've got four very different teams, but each team has the player of the year from their conference on it. That's no coincidence, I don't think. They have their, their, their guy that they're going to focus on offensively, defensively, the guy who carries their team, and a bunch of nice complimentary players. And I think you could say that for all four teams. I'd like to see how now those four guys, you know, the Sundarius Thornton, yep. Thornwell, the uh, Justin Jacksons, uh, Dylan Brooks, see how those guys perform on the biggest stage this coming weekend is going to be a lot of fun. It is going to be fun, and there's been something, a theme I've noticed with this tournament. It kind of starts a little slow. You know, field is 64. Maybe people thought it was a little bit boring. Then the weekend finishes fantastic in round of 32. Same thing with the Sweet 16. Not so much drama there. It was all about plays that almost didn't happen than the plays that did. Elite Eight, incredible. You know, we get these sort of moments where it seems like, yes, putting the bow on it always seems to be it finishing with just – such a huge bang. So I think that could happen in the final four. I'm not so sure if these final four games themselves are going to be exciting, but I think that the final is going to deliver. This is much like a year ago where the two final four games really not that memorable. And then of course you get the incredible Chris Jenkins three pointer to win the yeah. tournament. You know, so I feel like that could possibly be what we're looking at as we head to Phoenix. Yeah, I think the expectation level for the first round has been just blown up so much over the years over you know a couple of great upsets in the last 10 15 20 years and the hype that's how CBS pumps it up it, it's some Cinderella's chance but we're not seeing that as much anymore but we are seeing as you get down to the sweet 16 the elite eight we're seeing some really good basketball and some really good basketball teams we've had some great games leading up here gosh the weekend at the garden the Wisconsin Florida ending are you kidding me South Carolina Florida was tight yesterday Obviously, the North Carolina-Kentucky game. So when you whittle through those teams that probably, you know, shouldn't be in the tournament, your Cinderella's are turning into the 7 seed South Carolina, the 11 seed Xavier. Those are the new Cinderella's of this NCAA tournament. Now. Yeah, Cinderella's in major conferences because South yeah, Carolina yeah. has been labeled Cinderella. But does the slipper actually fit? Here is a look at the underrated basketball history of the Gamecocks.
So no one will call <laughs> Oregon a Cinderella, yet they haven't been to the Final Four since 1939. One coach who does know the Ducks well is Iona head coach Tim Clewis, and he joins us now. Hey, coach, you had another fantastic season, but the Ducks were a difficult matchup for your Iona Gales. Tell us how this Oregon team will match up against the Tar Heels. How could they possibly upset North Carolina? Well, they got to continue to make shots like they've been doing. They've done a terrific job of that. They share the ball extremely well. They're really, really patient on the offensive end. And then they have had really good rim protection. So when you do beat them, even though they, they lost Boucher, they still have great rim protection. I think the young man had eight blocks in his last game. Um, and they're just a tough team. that they, have, they can beat you off the dribble from three or four different spots. And, again, every one of them is willing to make the extra pass. Coach, uh, you mentioned the defense. Oregon plays just six guys, though. North Carolina much deeper. Now, depth is one of those tournament catchphrases that's often equated with success. But is it going to matter for Oregon playing on a, such a short bench against North Carolina? Well, I think they can go to their seventh and eighth as long as they're not going for extensive minutes. So if they're going for two or three-minute clips, I think they're okay. And it all depends on if you get in foul trouble or not, and they've been able to manage that so far. Coach Roy Williams, he's been to nine Final Fours. The other three coaches, all there for the first time. How much of an edge does that give North Carolina? I think the edge is that he can speak to his players about what to expect for the whole week and try to get their emotions under control a lot quicker than maybe some of the other programs that are going there for the first time and players that are going there for the first time. A lot of times kids will use up a lot of their adrenaline and emotions with all the interviews and everyone telling them how great they are. and They've got to be brought back down to earth relatively quick, and I'm sure you know, Coach will be able to do that having been through this more. You don't want their just heads in the clouds. you got to bring them back down there <laughs> and tell them how great they are. They are doing great. Uh, let's they're switch they're gears. doing great, but they'll come home soon then. Yeah. <laughs> All right, good point. Coach, let's talk uh, about the other ball game. Uh, two teams not a whole lot of experience at all in the Final Four. Let's start with Gonzaga, 14th in the nation in scoring offense and went 12 of 24 from three-point land against Xavier in the Elite Eight. Now, on the flip side, South Carolina, that's some defense. They've been locking teams down in the perimeter. Do you think that's going to continue? Can defense win out? The Gamecocks slow down the Zags? Well, if you look at how West Virginia played the Zags, I thought they gave them a really hard time, and the Zags had a hard time scoring the ball against West Virginia. And I think South Carolina's defense is, is right there at that level and, and might be playing better offensively at this time than West Virginia did in that particular game. So, you know, Frank Martin does a terrific job, and, well, you know, it's going to be a great game to watch. Yeah, we're looking forward to that one. Tyler Dorsey, he's our adrenaline performer. It's presented by Toyota. Let's go places. He's not the only star of the tournament, of course. Darius Thornwell from South Carolina. Nigel Williams-Goss from Gonzaga. Joel Berry from UNC. Coach, if you have one guy who you can have their hands on the ball in the final possession, who is it in this final four? Tyler Dorsey. Why is it? He has made big shot after big shot, and I think he's done it seven straight games now. He's had scored over 20 points a game, and you know, he just can score from the outside. He can beat you on the dribble. He's good around the post area, and he's just playing with a ton of confidence right now. You can see it in him that he's, he just believes in himself. You know, Coach, sorry, Ryan, you, you've obviously been coaching basketball for a very long time. You saw Dorsey up close and personal. I mean, what really separates him from the best of the best of college basketball? I think the fact that not only can he shoot the ball and drive the ball, but that he's got a really good sense of when to get rid of the ball and where the open spots are. He, he does a really good job getting to his right hand. He sets you up left a lot and comes back to his strength. And if you give him any space, he's knocking it down. And he doesn't care what time, what score. If you need a basket, he's going to get it. Coach, let me follow up with, uh, with Dorsey and, and Brooks here. Facing a two-headed monster like that, one in Dorsey who shoots so well from outside and Brooks who just goes so strong to the hoop, how tough is that as a coach to defend? It's really hard to defend, and you add to it. You know, Ennis was pretty good, too. I think he's the best stationary three-point shooter on their entire team, and he also gets to the rim at will. And Pritchard, their point guard, doesn't turn the ball over and really does a great job of keeping his dribble alive, trying to find his other players. Coach, got to ask you for your prediction. Who do you think is going to the national title game, and who do you think wins? Oh, boy. Um... I don't want to go there, but if I was going to pick one team right now, I'd probably say North Carolina has the most depth and most talent overall in their roster. So 
and, and the experience of having seven guys there last year, I'd probably have to lean a little towards them, but it wouldn't shock me if any one of the four teams won it. I'm looking forward to really enjoying this weekend. Yeah, I hope you can enjoy this weekend. And again, congratulations on another fantastic season. You basically are building a dynasty up there in New Rochelle. We are paying attention. We are watching. And uh, congrats, like I said, to your Iona Gales on a fantastic Thank season. you very much. Really, really appreciate you. Thanks, time. Coach. Journey to the Tourney, presented by Symmetra, Retirement Benefits Life. Hey everybody, Seth Davis here for SI.com. The Final Four is set. I don't know about you, but I had all four teams in the Final Four. It was so obvious this was going to be our final quartet. Let me break down that first game for you between South Carolina and Gonzaga. There are a couple of obvious storylines strategically going into this game, but I want to focus on the two units that I think are being overlooked. First of all, South Carolina's offense. Yes, their defense is phenomenal, but they have been playing great defense all season long. This is a team that about early to mid-February went through a very, very bad stretch where they couldn't score the ball, I think because they were getting mentally ground down by their defense-oriented style. But what we've seen in this tournament is that teams that have to play against South Carolina over the course of the 40 minutes, they get mentally worn down South Carolina's offense, their scoring efficiency is off the charts compared to what they did in the regular season. They are playing both ends of the floor exceptionally well, and their offense is the real reason why they're in the Final Four. Conversely, everybody talks about Gonzaga's offense, but what people don't realize is that the Zags have been ranked for most of the season number one in the country in overall defensive efficiency, and it's not because of the level of their competition in the West Coast Conference. We've seen what they can do. Gonzaga at all five positions, all throughout their lineup, and even off the bench, is a big, physical, strong team, and I think that's going to negate one of South Carolina's biggest advantages, their toughness, their physicality, and once that advantage is declared even, then I think Gonzaga's overall skill and balance, and of course, Big Shem in the middle is going to make the difference. It's been a dream season all season long for Gonzaga, and I say the Zags are going to play on Monday night. So let's break down the nightcap between North Carolina and Oregon. Now, obviously, when you play North Carolina, the number one thing you have to do is keep the Tar Heels off the offensive glass. I thought Kentucky actually did a pretty good job of that in the regional final, and that's going to be a huge responsibility on Jordan Bell. For a guy who doesn't score a ton of points, Jordan Bell is the most dominant player in the NCAA tournament. He was the captain of my all glue team. He's going to be really responsible for trying to defend all those North Carolina big men. I could also make the argument that Oregon is going to have the two best offensive players in the game in Dylan Brooks and Tyler Dorsey. Dorsey has been out of this world shooting lights out in the NCAA tournament. It's been a great ride for Oregon, but you know what? North Carolina is, in fact, the better team at both ends of the floor, and that will be apparent on Saturday night as the Tar Heels will win and advance to the championship game. And finally, my final four rising star presented by Symmetra. There are going to be a lot of big stories at the final four. None bigger, none better than Big Shem. Shem at Karnowski, Gonzaga's seven foot one, 300 pound center. He's a native of Poland. The story of how he got to Gonzaga, his ultra electric, powerful beard, which I'm convinced has superpowers, and his story at coming back from back surgery. He lost 60 pounds, got himself into shape, wasn't sure he'd ever play again. Shemek Karnowski might not have the most points and rebounds in these games at the Final Four, but he is a truly unique player. You don't find many classic back-to-the-basket centers. I call Shemek Karnowski like the rug in the movie The Big Lebowski. He really ties the room together. His presence down in the post is what makes Gonzaga's half-court offense work. Even if he doesn't get the assist, he gets the hockey assist because every time you pass it to him in the post, you have to double him. He's great at making passes out of it. The ball moves, and somebody from Gonzaga gets an open shot. I also think he's a great zone buster in the high post, a good rebounder. He's got a nice touch. And let me tell you something, the big fella can run. That means that Gonzaga is capable of beating a team like North Carolina 85 to 80. It's also capable of beating a team like South Carolina 65 to 60. I think it's going to be a big weekend for Gonzaga, and Big Shem is going to be the biggest reason why. Journey to the Tourney, presented by Symmetra, Retirement Benefits Life. Now to the NFL, where it appears the Raiders are indeed heading to Las Vegas. According to an ESPN report from Adam Schefter, the Raiders have enough votes from owners to approve the team's move to Vegas. And let's welcome in MMQB writer Albert Breer. He's at the owners' meetings in Arizona, so we, we go there now, courtesy of Toyota. Let's go places. All right, Albert, take us through the timeline. If this vote passes on Monday, 
when will the Raiders actually play a game in Las Vegas? Well, I think that's, that's an open question right now. That's kind of one of the loose ends. they got to figure out what's going to happen with the temporary facility. Um, Sam Boyd Stadium and UNLV would be the logical place for them to play. The question is when that stadium is going to be ready. And that's getting it ready for things like instant replay, getting the video equipment ready, all the different things you have to do to get a uh, stadium NFL compliant. Um, so the question becomes when they're going to go, like you said, and they'll play at least this year in Oakland. They've got the option to play in Oakland in 2018. Um, and then I think everybody's guess is by 2019, they'll be playing in Sam Boyd Stadium um, in Las Vegas with the new stadium set to open in 2020. Again, that's an open question. I think it kind of depends on how things go in 2017 in Oakland. If things get really ugly, I would expect that they'd pull the plug early and try to go and play at UNLV Stadium um, in 2018. For so long, the league was apprehensive to put a team in Las Vegas. Why do the owners think that this move will be a success now? Well, let's move the gambling thing out of the way. I don't think that's a problem for anybody at all. Most owners believe that gambling um, on sports will eventually be legal, and so they're better off now kind of working through the problem and getting gambling above board um, rather than fighting it. The, the real issue here would be market size, and that's you know part of the apprehension on some of the owners to approve this move is going from the sixth largest market in the country in the Bay Area to the 40th largest market in the country. On top of that, Vegas is very reliant on discretionary income. We all know about that, and that makes it susceptible in an, in an economic downturn. Um, and it's always towards the top of the list in foreclosures per capita. Um, so there is a question, you know, in that sort of market, whether or not you're going to be able to move the premium product. I'm talking about club seats, suites, that sort of thing. What the owners believe mitigates the problem here is the Oakland Raiders brand and the fact that the Oakland Raiders have always been um, a national brand. And so they've got that fan base in Southern California that travels to go and see them in Oakland. Um, I think the NFL figures that now it being a four hour drive from Los Angeles, that fan base will um, be coming to games in Las Vegas. And then, you know, because it's, again, a different type of brand, I think there's a feeling that a lot of the Northern California fan base will stick by the Raiders. And so the natural nature of the Raiders brand, which is a little unique, I think they believe that mitigates the market size problem. And again, I, I haven't run into too many people who think gambling is going to be much of an issue. Albert Breer of the MMQB.com at the owners meetings in Arizona. Albert, appreciate your time. Thanks so much. All right. Thanks, Maggie. All right, let's end the day with a feel-good story. Not that the Raiders to Vegas is not a feel-good story, but uh, last Wednesday, a little different. Last Wednesday was World Water Day. Professional surfer John Rose has made it his life's mission to bring clean water to millions around the world who don't have any. Watch this. I was in uh, Northern California. I was there until 10, and then me and my dad moved to Laguna, and that's where I started surfing. I guess with any sports, when you're a kid, you're doing it just because it's fun, and you're doing it with all your friends. It just seems like the right thing to do. And then I think at a certain point, you realize, well, I'm pretty good at this, or I'm better, because you, you can see, you're like, maybe I'm better than the kids that are around me. I really, you know, just, it was a one-track mind. I just said, you know, this is what I'm here to, I, I literally thought I was put on this earth to be a pro surfer. I, I gave it up because all the kids were better than me. <laughs> I mean, I think you're gonna hit a point where you're not the guy anymore, you know? The kids are better than you, and there's a reality check there. And some people refuse to look at that reality check, you know? And I'm just not one of those guys. I was always a realist, um, and, I maybe could have gone a little longer and milked it, but for me, I was just like, you know, this has been amazing, and I just, I, it's time for a new chapter. I had no idea what I was gonna do. The idea for Waves for Water came because my dad was actually doing some work in, um, he was helping uh, little villages in Africa um, catch rainwater. It was a passion of his, and so that brought the topic of access to clean water into my radar. To me, you didn't have to be an expert to help with water you know, wells, rain catchment systems, filtration, all those things existed. I just start to apply them. So yeah, it just was an organic, um, at least the idea came in very organically and then, you know, the universe validated it with a giant earthquake. I can't get the past, see? Yeah, this is chaos in Haiti, yo. 
went out there to go implement my first project with Waves for Water, which was going to be 10 water filters I bought with my own money. And before I got to get, before I got to the village I was planning to help, I got caught in a 7.2 earthquake, and um, I became the first responder by accident. And you know, the, I, I I used those filters in that situation, and it, you know, I got a crash course in so many lessons. The big epiphany was like, I barely tried. This was just like a cool, fun pet project idea. And these 10 filters impacted thousands of lives. What if I tried? So it became like an obsession after that. For the last couple years, I've been working on a feature documentary film with Red Bull TV. And it really kind of chronicles the Waves for Water story. And sort of my life leading up to it. Waves for Water is a platform for people to go out there and exercise their passions and provide access to clean water, basically. That's the, the directive of that. The old model of martyrdom, um, going out there and people are suffering, so we have to, you know, it's like, I don't believe in that. I, you know, I wanna, I, I wanna encourage people to go do all the things they love and then just plug some purpose into that. An unbelievable story. Yeah. Someone who I love when athletes use their platform and use their celebrity for something good like this. I mean, literally thousands of people are their lives are better I, because of John Rose's initiative. I love what he said too that he had this impact without even trying. What could he do if he actually, he actually tried? tried? He's think, following his passion. Good we're stuff. seeing that now. That's yeah. really great. Uplifting way to end our Monday episode yeah. of SI Now. That's going to do it for us. We'll be back tomorrow at 10:30 a.m. Eastern time. But until then. Keep it locked to SI.com for all the latest news. And, of course, we will just catch you tomorrow. Catch your breath. Final four, five days away. <laughs> Going to take a nap. Yeah. Bye.